we are recording. Tony Amendola, welcome, 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 and thank you so very much for joining me on Hathor Hosts. Uh, what a treat! What a treat and a delight it is to have you with me. Um, we had a little bit of a false start there, but we're off and running now, so that's good. Uh, how is your day been going? You know, it's going it's going well. Uh, I had a lovely walk uh, this morning. You know, I've been uh, I've been getting out, trying to walk three or five miles to start my day, Very just good. to get energy up. Yeah, yeah, it's been nice. Uh, uh, you know, I see deer. I see. Um, I see other uh, uh, other living things which are important. So. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, tonight I wanted to say, uh, rather than sort of start chronologically with your career, because you've had such an extraordinary and illustrious career that has gone on and for 40 odd years, is it, that you've been working yes. in the And I mean, that's remarkable. Yeah. Uh, so rather than work chronologically, we're going to just sort of hand pick uh, some of your incredible credits and dip in and out, a lucky dip, if you will, of your amazing <laughs> work. Um, but before we do that, uh, I'm always curious to see how actors get started in their careers. And what I wanted to know is, uh, you'd said somewhere once before that there are two types of actors. There are lifers, and then there are those who sort of fall into it, and that you are in the latter category. So. Can you elaborate a little on that? Yeah, yeah. You know, there are people who, from the time they were born, they knew they were going to be actors or performers, or, or uh, uh, and they've had a craving for it. They're the people that, uh, you know, uh, have shows in their living rooms and put on puppet plays and <laughs> do all those wonderful things that I think are, are lovely. I, I never had that. I, uh, I sort of had a very regular childhood, no interest in theater or any of those things, uh, you know, interested in sports, interested in those types of things, and then stumbled into acting in college. Right. And stumbled into it primarily socially, you know, to, uh, to have a, a place to put my energy and my passion uh, as a college student, not knowing what to do with it. And only later that I realized and begin to respect what acting is, uh, you know, and, and the kind of place it can lead you. And I think so. That's what I mean by that. And, you know, on one hand, I didn't have the tools that a person would have if they started at nine with dancing and singing lessons and all those <laughs> things. But on the other hand, I had my childhood. Yeah. That wasn't about that. So, you know, it's a trade off. So. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, when you did start acting, you sort of said you literally fell into it. So, what, what did that mean? <laughs> I, stumbled, I stumbled into an audition. I literally stumbled into an audition at a school and it was a state uh, teacher's college. And so it was probably maybe uh, three women for each man, that type of situation. Uh, and so consequently, they, if you could walk and you were male, <laughs> you, were, you were in the play. Yeah. And uh, luckily, there was quite a wonderful instructor there who had just uh, retired from the Yale School of Drama. I grew up in New Haven and uh, she had had really amazing students. Uh, and so she would tutor me yeah. uh, during her lunch hour, you know, so I ended up spending a lot of time with her and that was really, her name was Constance Welch. Uh, it was very old school training. It was right in the late 60s, early 70s and there was a real divide about what acting is. And she was a very old school type teacher, but very, very useful to me. Oh, fantastic. And stood you in good stead later on. Yeah, because yeah. You spent about 14 years, I think it was, sort of cutting your teeth on theatre, uh, which is always the best training in the world. And in particular, some of the greatest dialogue ever written, which is, of course, Shakespeare. And um, you have played some amazing Shakespearean roles. I mean, Titans, Shylock, Lear. Uh, and I wondered what it was about Shakespeare that sort of keeps drawing you back. You, you know, it was the first play I ever did. Speaking of Constance, well, she cast me in The Tempest and in Cymbeline. And uh, I think it was because I was Mediterranean looking yeah. and the wonderful parts in Shakespeare for that. And, uh, and then gradually, you know, I, I like to think of Shakespeare as, as being like, it's sort of like juggling. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's an additional ball or two. Yeah. Because not only are we're modern actors, so we have to 
you know, look for the psychology and, and those things within a character. And yet at the same time, we're juggling the language, we're juggling other uh, aspects, big ideas. Um, and so consequently, I think that's what draws me to it. I've always, I've always been probably foolishly comfortable in it because I, I was never told that what I was doing was wrong. I, I, you know, it was the first lines I ever spoke. Uh, I don't want to misrepresent myself and say, I know how to do Shakespeare. I, this is the way. No, it was just something. And I had wonderful opportunities, you know, in addition to, you know, the Lear and Shylock, I got to do uh, Iago twice. Oh, wow. Uh, Leon twice. Oh. Uh, you know, 10 years apart. So it was always interesting to, to do a role and shape it and then come back to it 10 years later. So, you know, you've been on stage, you've had that experience on stage. Now, where can you take it? What have those 10 years meant to you, particularly with, a, you know, some of the bigger roles? Uh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, they're all, they all break down to very human things. You know, what does it feel like to be slighted, mm -hmm. to, be, to feel like you're disrespected? It's funny, when I was doing uh, a fellow, uh, some people, you know, the, the extremity of what Iago uh, puts a fellow through, they thought, well, I, I don't know about, you know, they didn't believe it. And I said, you know, it's funny you say you can't believe it because, you know, I grew up in a world where, you know, when boys had something to work out, they worked it out with their fists, maybe a stick. Yeah. Now we live in a world where you shoot everyone on the stoop. Yeah. And you can't understand why, you know. Uh, so, um, it, and Lear, of course, just the rage, mm -hmm. the simple rage of, of losing power and getting old. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard, that's hard to explain to a 35 year old, but when you get, you know, older, you begin to realize those, you know, we're, we're so conscious of slights these days. And uh, um, age is a very interesting one, you know, when, uh, yeah. and so you, you, you oh, know, yeah. as an actor, great. <clears throat> you tie into those things as an actor. And consequently, that's why, you know, everyone thinks actors are neurotic. No, it's actors who don't work. Because yeah. if you're a working actor and lucky, you get to work all that stuff out. Yeah, and, and there is something, the, the kind of, um, I mean, I'm sort of starting to experience it now, you know, being an older woman in the business oh. and particularly a woman who was cast in certain roles um, earlier in my career. And that now suddenly I'm very aware that that's beginning to shift. And yes. Even though on a uh, practical and from the text point of view, I'm like, oh my God, there's still amazing roles to play. There's still so much to explore and see. But I have to be honest, like it's from a vanity point of view, looking in the mirror, it's hard. And looking at self tapes where you're like, oh, is that what I look like? It's, it's brutal. It's difficult. It um, you know, I like to say it's difficult for men, nearly impossible for women. Yeah. Very but that said, you, uh, you know, your, your age has taken you into a place where you can live, which is a powerful woman. In yeah. other words, I, I, don't, I, I never would have thought of you as an ingenue. I thought of you as a leading lady. And I, it's strange, you know, well, it's strange because some people, particularly ingenues and, and even, even young juveniles, mm -hmm. that when they get older, they no longer make sense. Yeah. People see them and they still see the youth and they can't quite see the adult. But yeah. you, it, I mean, you, there's plenty, you know, you. it's difficult, but there, you know, you still make sense. Well, honey, from your lips to God's ears, let's hope. <laughs> um, getting back to Shakespeare for a minute. I think so many people are, are really terrified by the language. And I think certainly younger people today look at Shakespeare and think, oh, I don't, I don't even know where to start. Did you ever feel slightly daunted by the language or was it just something you went, yeah, makes sense? Yeah, you know, I think I, I think I did, but I just barreled through it. And, you know, as they say, sometimes you can search for the truth and sometimes you just barrel through and hope the truth catches up yeah. with you. So, I, you know, I just, uh, uh, just barreled through and uh, yeah, it is difficult language. But that's the richness of it, too. It, it's funny, I'm doing a project. I just, as a matter of fact, yesterday did a reading of, uh, uh, of The Tempest. And yeah. it's an adapted text. They got very well-known playwrights to work on Shakespeare's text and dust it a little bit and make it clearer. And, and they've done an amazing job because it is crystal clear. Yeah. But occasionally you think, 
that is crystal clear, but I miss the rhythm and I miss the distillation of being able to say a lot with, a f with not that many words. Yeah. And generally what ends up happening as, as a modern text, that one line of Shakespeare takes two lines to explain when you're trying to explain every nuance of it. Uh, and so it's interesting. I, you know, I love that they're doing it because anything that gets people to Shakespeare, I think is worthwhile. So. Absolutely. And also I think the theater, you know, you were saying, um, if I looked at your career or as I was preparing and I was looking at your work, you constantly go back to the theater. You know, you've had this wonderful film and television career, but it's balanced out by theater. What, why do you, what is it that you love so much about returning to the theater? Uh, the immediacy mm -hmm. is one. Uh, it's the source for me. You know, there's some people that never wanted to be theater actors. They always wanted to do film and television. Yeah. And that's where they feel most powerful. Me, I, I wish someday, and, and there have been times where what I feel I have inside of me has a, has a vessel for it in television and film, but generally not. It hasn't been. Uh, and, you know, and I'm very lucky. I'm not <laughs> complaining. And, and third, and most importantly, is I get to play the symphony every night. Yeah. I get to play what the role is every night. And, and so often when you do a film or a, a television thing, it's, it's clipped and your best work may not even be in it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's also very democratic. It, if either of us is on stage with the biggest star in the world, the audience will look at them, look at us, and then make up their mind after 50 of who they want to watch. And they create the close-up. Yeah. On, on, they're the ones. It's their attention. So it's consequently... Uh, it's much more democratic than, say, doing a film or television with a star, which is a wonderful thing, <laughs> uh, where you, you realize, no, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. I did Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, not Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark, I did a play. That's another Lewis thing. And, <laughs> that's another thing. I, and I was sitting with the producer. For some reason, the producer is very talkative, and we, we just hit it off. Generally, you know, as actors, you have to just sit and, you know, a conversation will develop or not. An actor came up to him, one of the regulars, and had a, a sort of a slightly heated, whispered conversation. And he said to me afterwards, you actors. And I said, what? He says, well, this guy's a regular on the show. We're paying him a ton of money. We brought in a big star uh, uh, guest spot and are paying him an enormous amount of money. And he comes up and asks me, Will he get 50-50 coverage with him? He wants to be certain that in the scene. And I told him, of course you'll get 50-50 I lied to him. Yeah. You're a star, all this money. So, you, so there it is. This guy could have done the best work in the world, but the, it's going to be tilted towards that star. And it's as it should be. It's no conspiracy. It's, whereas on, on stage, it's uh, every man and woman for themselves and yet all in it together. You yeah, know, that you have to bring your key. You have to. There's no second take. There's no third take. You have to be there. You know. Uh, so I, I enjoy the challenge of that. And I'll say one other thing. Sometimes you can be beaten down film and television. You get roles or don't get roles for no reason. Example: uh, uh, a friend of mine auditioned for a film. Uh, didn't hear for three months. Finally, he got the job. He panicked. Uh, he said, I, I don't know what I did anymore. They showed him the tape. The casting person said, have him come in. He's watching the audition tapes and he they, has all the actors on it. So he keeps watching oh. and, he keeps, and he realizes there are nine other people that could have done that job that he saw yeah. that were different, but equally as good. Does the job on the last day he's leaving and he says to the director, I just have one question for you. Say, Why did you cast me? I saw the tape and everything. And the director laughed. And says, well, you remind me of my uncle. So now we as actors go home and we don't eat for the weekend. And we look at our children and feel like failures. And we, meanwhile, that's how fickle casting is. Yeah. So. That's so true. I, um, a few years ago, I auditioned for a film and it was really not a role that I would ever normally be seen for. She was a heavily tattooed rock chick from a concert and I got a call back and another call back and another call back and I was I was actually doing Dragon Con in Atlanta mm. so I was like 
I had the guy who was looking after me running around the hotel, getting like fake tattoos. I cut up a t-shirt, I had grease in my hair. I was like, I'm going to get this film. Same thing. Didn't hear anything for months. Then I heard, no, you're definitely, it's between you and one other person. And then neither one of us got it. And in the end, about three years later, I bumped into the casting director and I've never done this before, but I was like, can I just ask what happened? Like, what, why did they go off me? And he went, oh, strangest thing. Director was on a flight flying to Germany. So a woman got on and he took one look at her and he went up to her and he said, are you an ex-musician rock chick? And she's like, yeah, I used to be a singer, why? And he's like, how'd, how'd you like to be in a movie? She just, and she was the part, she looked the part, you know, but that's casting. <laughs> so and that's that's the other weird thing about being an actor and uh, if you're a painter a musician uh, a, a singer no one supposes that they can do what you do mm -hmm. but if you're an actor there's a because what we're trying to represent is life and because what we're trying to make we never want to show the effort of doing something we want it just to be the thing itself yeah. People can mis uh, mistake skill uh, for um, anybody could do it type thing, yeah. you know, and that's always interesting, I find. So we're, <laughs> but that's, that's our life, isn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, getting back to your incredible television and film career, I'm going to read out, as I said at the beginning, we're just going to dip in and out. But just, I mean, here are just some of the few credits uh, and probably your most well-known ones. You have done everything from LA Law, Ali McBeal, Columbo, Seinfeld, The West Wing, Alias, General Hospital, Crusade, Lois and Clark, Charmed, Angel, The X-Files, CSI, NCIS, Numbers, The Mentalist, New Girl, Terminator, The Sarah Connor, Connor Chronicles, and The Blacklist, plus the ones that we're going to chat about a little more deeply. Um, who, was, who is that guy? Exactly. Well, I mean, interestingly, I was reading them out to my husband and he was like, you should do that. You should read them out to him like that, because that's <laughs> impressive when you hear back like this amazing body of work. It's incredible for any actor to keep working, but to work like you have so consistently, really, you know, I bow down. <laughs> I bow down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the first shows that I'd like to talk about a little more in depth are both seminal shows and both hugely, hugely popular. And that is, of course, Seinfeld and Will and & Grace. And you did them at kind of opposite ends of your career, if you like. <laughs> so I was uh, wondering if you remembered what your audition for Seinfeld was. Yeah, my audition for Seinfeld, uh, there were a lot of people, it was very quick. I, I felt like I did, did well. It is one of the shows that I've true. It's wonderful as an actor when you get to work on shows that you truly enjoy. Yeah. And Seinfeld, uh, you know, my wife could always tell when I was watching Seinfeld because it was one of the few shows that would make me laugh a lot because I grew up in the East Coast and it's that kind of humor, uh, you know, with Kramer and Elaine. And uh, so um, that one was uh, special to me. Uh, and also the co-star, actually, I, I was in a relationship in that episode with Terry Hatcher ah. from Adam Lois and Clark. Uh, um, so it was, uh, it was special, but I was, I was nervous. The thing I remember, you know, because I was fairly, fairly new in town, I, uh, Kramer, Michael Richards came out, do you want to run, run, run some lines? Yeah. And I said, oh, sure, sure, sure. So we sit on a set. And I can tell, you know, it's, it's been locked off. We really shouldn't be there. But now he's sitting on the, ah, come here. And he's eating an orange and he leaves a big mess. And he gets up. Oh, that sounds great. He leaves. And I'm looking at everything. And the, the second AD walks by and looks at me like, what are you doing? It's a hot set. You know, and I'm thinking, uh, Michael. And, uh, well, there's two other things I remember. Uh, Julia Drive is very nice really sort of, she was the Amanda of that. Yeah. Amanda, I thought, was the welcome wagon of Stargate. She made everybody on that set, new actors, feel welcome. In ways guys don't just get. It's not like they're being cruel. They just don't get that. But yeah. she was she was terrific. But the thing I'll never forget, I didn't know who Larry David was. Right. You, really, because he wasn't Larry David yet. Yeah. And uh, there was a guy on set, which who, in sitcoms you rehearse the whole thing, then there's a run through. And for the run through, this guy showed up, this bald guy, very tall, lean, 
uh, sneakers on, sort of a coat, sport jackets, very, very casual. But here's the deal. He alternated between playing with his yo-yo or flossing his teeth. So I thought, Isn't this, this is the guy with the power on this head. And sure enough, that was Larry David. Yeah. You know? uh, so you cut to a number of years later, and uh, I'm doing Will and Grace again, which is sort of an iconic show. And now I'm much more comfortable on the set. And mm -hmm. uh, James Burrow directed, who's uh, someone I'm wow. working with. I mean, he's, and you know, it's interesting as actors because we always assume that someone else has the missing last piece to the crossword puzzle that is ourselves. That if we can only get this piece, all of our career will just blossom and it'll be done. And you, you look to directors for that. And I've had this experience several times. He said nothing to me. Now, that is a good thing. Yeah. If you're a young actor, you think that's a bad thing. No. That is, you know, and he also stopped calling me Tony and started calling me Anthony. That uh. is also, <laughs> you know, it's sort of a familiar thing. It's the reverse of what familiar should be, but I, it's a back east thing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so I loved it. And the other thing I'll never forget you know, Megan Mullally couldn't have been nicer, and uh, everyone uh, was terrific. And but there was a guy who played Smitty in this episode, who's the foil for Megan Mullally. He was ninety years old. Wow! And there we are sitting in the green room, still working. And uh, <laughs> it was actually sort of uh, he had just he had just lost his wife, mm. just just of many many years. And he told me this, and we're sitting in the room, and he's telling me this. And I said, um, I said, you know, I'm so I'm really, really sorry. And I said to him, um, I said the opposite of what you think. I said, I bet you're glad you're here. And he was. That's where he needed to be. His wife was in the business. That's where he needed to spend his time. So those are the two things I remember. And also, you know, I play. I was. I'm on my run of priests now, in case yeah. you, you've noticed that. Uh, so it was great. It was great. Uh, and I, I'm thrilled. I didn't get to do a few. I hardly ever got to do uh, sitcoms. I've maybe done four, all very different. Titus was another one I got to do. Uh, oh, which is great. Very, um, uh, Seinfeld. You know, people look at me and think, oh, you're, you're a good actor. But, you know, sitcom is not the first thing they see, you know. So, <laughs> And you have to accept that, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I've always loved, I mean, for me, sitcom, I only did two, I think, in the time that I lived in L.A. Um, but my experience was so fantastic because it's such a great marriage between theater and film and television. Because, of course, you rehearse like a play for four or five days and then you shoot it in front, front of an audience. Did you enjoy that process? I enjoy it very much because it's like a theater. The hours are so much better than, as you know, yeah. hour longer. Film. And the pay. <laughs> the pay. But I'll tell you a funny story. But here's the thing. You can't fall in love with the laughter. Uh, the one time I was fired in film, in television, was from a sitcom. And oh. we did the run through. And I, Suzanne, they laughed. So, they laughed so much. They, I mean, they just carried on. And my age, and I knew. I knew there was something uh, really, really, really weird. My agent called and said, you want the good news or the bad news? And I said, uh, well, give me the bad news. He says, you're fine. I said, well, give me the good news. He says, well, they have to pay you. And <laughs> here's, here's the deal, though. Uh, until you've been fired once, you, you, there's an old saying, until you've been fired once, you're not really a professional. You know? Yeah. And, and the sitcom never really went on. Yeah, uh, well, there you go. That showed them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, so those were the fond memories and it's, uh, you know, they're always the cherry. Uh, you know, it feels different going, doing a sitcom for me. It feels very different. It's very joyful. It's not, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a sort of comedic influence that you draw upon? Somebody who's influenced your, your um, work? You know, the ones that I really like are the character comedians. In other words, they're just great actors. Like uh, some, of the, some of the stuff De Niro has done late in his career where you, he, he walks the line between the character and the comedy in a, <clears throat> a kind of way. I was a big fan. It sort of shocked me when I saw Al Pacino in Dick Tracy. He had a role, he was so funny. Yeah. And 
uh, so I've always admired uh, those guys. But you know, David Hyde Pierce, the, and uh, are yeah, incredible. But there's 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 no connection. I mean, I could never in a million years. I sort of imitations is a great tool, you know, to to you get your feet under you. But I could no more imitate <laughs> David Hyde Pierce than, you know, people wonder, who is, what is that? That's very strange. <laughs> um, I've always liked Judd Hirsch. Um, who else? Uh, um, comedians. Uh, uh, Kevin Klein, I think, is a brilliant sort of comedian. Uh, John Cleese, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Fish Called Wanda is a yeah. still go-to film. When I need to, although it's probably not as politically correct anymore. <laughs> the go-to film, right, exactly. For anyone who's wondering why, I was just thinking there'll be a whole generation of people who haven't seen it going, why did she just sniff her armpit in the middle of an interview? Yeah, <laughs> he won the Kevin Gore. Yeah, he did the Kevin Gore for that, as I recall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so those, uh, more, yeah, more, more character cast. I'd love the uh, uh, three, uh, not the Three Stooges, the Marx Brothers. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, a lot of the classic ones. You know, I was sick when I was young for about a year, uh, not even, maybe about eight months. I had, uh, so I was, had to be in bed. Uh, and so I got to watch a lot of television. And, uh, uh, and I remember watching a lot of Laurel and Hardy, Marx Brothers. And it's funny with actors, how many actors something like that has happened to that became actors? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you meant you spent. You had to spend a lot of time alone, occupying yourself before there was computers and uh, etc. Exactly. <laughs> um, the next things I'd love to chat about are your kind of big studio pictures, uh, which were specifically The Mask of Zorro, and then the sequel, The Legend of Zorro, Blow, and Annabelle. So I'm going to start, I think, with The Mask of Zorro, and I just wondered. I mean, you know. It was Spielberg, right? Who was mm -hmm. producing. So, you don't, yeah, you don't get bigger than that, right? <laughs> and no. I wondered if you felt any kind of pressure to deliver, if, and if there was a sense of stepping onto that set like, oh, this is the big time. Yeah, it, it, it was a sort of tense day. It's an interesting story. I had auditioned for the role. Um, what's his name? Uh, I believe his name is Robert Rodriguez, who directed La Mariachi and yeah. a bunch of other. He was supposed to direct that film at the beginning. Oh. And I went in and auditioned for him. And it was a very different film. It was, you know, very strange and a different kind of Zorro. And I remember, he, because his films are so out there, when I met the man, he was very shy. He hardly looked at me. And, and, but it wasn't like he was doing busy. Some, he was just not comfortable. Yeah. And I knew, I knew I did a good audition because over the course of doing the audition, he actually looked up and started looking at me. I thought, oh, okay. So sure enough, my agent calls and said, well, there's a good, this is starting in September. There's a very good chance you're going to uh, do this. Go off and do your play. I went off and did a play. And hopefully when you come back, you'll be employed. And then I get a call in August saying, well, no, no, uh, there's a whole different project. Uh, he dropped out. So that's that. I then audition again, now this time for Martin Campbell, right, right. who's, you know, James Bond films, everything. And again, same role, which is very unusual because generally they clean the slate. Mm -hmm. uh, same role, and I go and it goes well. And here's an interesting thing. I had done a film for John Sayles, who's a, a very an independent filmmaker, who's done Make One, uh, quite a well-known American independent, uh, very respected. He's sort of the more... You, you, every film he makes, you, you'd go see it, sort of in the way Woody Allen at the time, every yeah. year he'd make it. And he, he kept, I had done that film, and, he, and Martin keeps saying to me, I've seen you, I've seen you. And I, being foolish, I was, oh, I don't know. You know, I didn't, I didn't immediately say, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and come to find out, he had just seen uh, Lone Star, which is the film I was in of John Sayles, and he loved it. And because that's an independent film, and he used to be an independent filmmaker before James Bond and Zorro, that was what tilted it. There were eight other people that could have done that job, but I convinced him that I could do the job and that we would have fun. And John Sayles gave me the seal of approval. Correct. So I think that's why I got that job. Now, 
on the first day, I remember, I'm thinking, oh my God, I remember standing on the stairwell. I had to, I rode in on a horse, then had to run up. And the first thing, and I remember being very nervous, actually. And he came over to me and said, um, you don't have to act that hard. He said, yes. no acting, please, basically. He was very nice. And he was one of, you know, the British directors are great because they, um, I've always had very good relations with British directors and stuff because they'll, they're trying to guide you, but they don't guide you in any touchy-feely way. Yeah. They try to somehow make it, they joke about it and make it that it's not important to put, at least that's been my experience, to put you at your ease. And he was very, very nice. Uh, and, uh, and then just, you know, you're in a moving city. You're, you, I mean, you're moving, you know, with 400 people. It's just fantastic. Yeah. And the clothes, and of course, Anthony Hopkins, and... Uh, now, you have two lovely little Anthony Hopkins stories. Um, would you share those with us? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, yeah. The first one was as a student. Uh, uh, I was going between Philadelphia and New Haven, and I stopped and saw uh, Anthony Hopkins do Equus. And back then... Part of the seating was like a Greek theater and you sat on stage. Those were the cheap seats, mm -hmm. you know, for students. Uh, and it was fantastic. And because you were 15 feet away from me. And it was, it had such an effect on me. And afterwards I had to wait for a train. So I went to a coffee shop. And who walks in 25 minutes after Curtin? Anthony Hopkins. And I'm leaving to catch my train. And, and I, I just, I just had to say, you know, that, that was just fantastic. And, and thank you very much. And I'm, I'm studying acting. I turned to go. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he asked, he just spent two minutes with me and asked me, you know, what was I studying? You know, what was it? And was just so, so warm and so, so approachable mm. uh, that I, he, he always had a special place. So then you cut 30 years yeah. or so. And I'm doing a film with him and I couldn't, <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. And, you know, we talked about that. Of course, no reason he should remember me, but I just, uh, it's kindness. But the other story, I'm certain that you, you're thinking, I, um, when you do a big film, and all of a sudden I was on that four months, and uh, now it's 10 days before I come home. Mm -hmm. What do I do? What am I going to do with myself? Am I ever going to work again? What is, what? <laughs> and all of a sudden I go back to my hotel, and there is a script <laughs> in my hotel room. And I open up, dear Tony, very interested in you for the part of blank, 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 spoke to your agent, all is a go with your okay. Let us know ASAP. I think, Suzanne, I think <laughs> this is it. This, 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 this is how it works. This is the list. This is how yeah. it works. And Thanks, you're on a list. Baby. <laughs> I read, I read one I I'm in immediately, mind you. I mean, unless there's something so objectionable. <laughs> Yeah. I'm in, unless it's a snuff film, I'm in, yeah. you know, uh, another good scene, another, so when I get to the sixth good scene, I begin to get suspicious. It is then that I track it down and I realize they have sent the script to the wrong Tony. The script is for Tony Hopkins and the offer was for Meet Joe Black. Oh, there you go. There it is. <laughs> and, you know, and to me, and for some reason, rather than depressing me, it made me laugh. I do laugh. love that story, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it sort of encapsulates uh, like the actor's hopes and aspirations and the bottom falling out. <laughs> but Absolutely. Yeah. Coming back to earth with a bump. <laughs> um, yeah. I wanted to chat about your another priest that you played, which was the priest in Annabelle, which when I was looking at the posters, I was like, that's where the Hathor wig went. Because <laughs> right. she, she definitely punched that wig. Um, <laughs> but I think horror is a really interesting genre. I used to be obsessed with it as a kid, and now I can only watch it like this. I'm like, I can barely, you know, I literally, it's the only way I feel safe is watching like this. Um, but I wonder, because if it's overdone, horror, I think it's a bit like, yeah. it, it can just be, it can just fall flat. So firstly, I wondered, because it's, you, you're acting effectively opposite a doll, <laughs> and, your journey as the priest, he has to go on quite a big journey because at first you're like, well, it's, you're not convinced and then you have to be convinced. So how did you prepare for that? You know, I, it's funny. I don't tend to think at, at its core, I don't approach any material necessarily that differently. At its core, I just look at it 
as sort of an acting, an acting uh, uh, a task. Right. And it, it's the demands, as you say, of horror or of farce or something else that will color it and make it different. But I tried to find, for lack of a better word, something I can relate to or some truth. I, I was a Catholic altar boy, so uh, I had that going. And, uh, and my mother always wanted me to be a priest. So, you know, there you go. So, um, and I knew, uh, so, you know, I approached it that way and I knew I was okay because at the times uh, I was still smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a while ago. I haven't, I haven't smoked in a while. And I remember being out in front of the church, having a cigarette in my vestments and uh, the, all the film stuff was in the back. So, you know, I was quietly running lines and a woman came up with her son yeah and so i blessed the son and gave him a little pat on the head and i thought well there it is she thinks i'm a that's all that's all you know the parishioner <laughs> thing uh so but the horror thing you're absolutely right i think the danger for the actor in horror uh, this is an interesting thing next time you watch a horror film turn off the sound mm. and you'll see this is what because it is the sound that is so the mixing and 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 the, and the way uh, that you don't have to provide that. It's yeah. done so in the editing and stuff. So you have to play a simple truth in in a kind of way. It's highly realistic, uh, you know. Uh, unless you're into the slasher films or those things, and that's slightly different. Sure. Uh, but these these were uh, you know I thought it was interesting. They were uh, more psychological horror yeah. films in the in the vein of Rosemary's Baby or something. And to my mind, The Conjuring is one of the best horror films ever made. So the Conjuring, scary. fantastic film. And I saw that beforehand Yeah. Uh, to get me into the Warren, Warren's world, which are the, the couple that a lot of these exploits are tied to. And they, they were from Connecticut, which is where I'm from. Uh, and, but here's another interesting thing. And I don't want to, it's just fate. I was supposed to do a film in Sicily. It's a very, very low budget film, but it was in Sicily, yeah. you know? It was, uh, you know, playing actually a cardinal. Uh, and I did the audition. Uh, it was a long weekend. I did the audition on a Monday and a Tuesday. I heard back, great interest. On a Wednesday, uh, <laughs> uh, there was an offer. On a Thursday, I found out there was a problem. And on a Friday, the role was gone. Oh. And so it was just, you, were, you couldn't, you know, it was too much of a roller coaster. Well, right then I had auditioned for Annabelle. My agent called. And when I auditioned, the breakdown was for a younger man. You need, they wanted to go with a, a priest 35 or right out of probably the seminary, that type of thing. And they said, they still haven't cast this role. This is not an offer. They're wondering if you would do them a favor and just read, come in for the table read. It's not an offer. You know, they're, they're, they'd be very grateful. Alfre Woodard was in it, who's a, one of my favorite actresses from Warmth. Yeah, so I thought, okay, I, I was this close from putting up my middle finger and yeah. saying, I did it. This close. And then I thought, well, why, why stay at home being miserable, probably making my wife miserable, you know, because, you know, the spouses react to our emotional states. Yeah. I'm going to go do it. So I did. And from the moment I walked in, everyone treated me like I had the part. Now, this is what's interesting so i went from not having the part to reading i shoot the film and now i'm on the tour <laughs> i'm doing all the tv shows i'm doing all the radio shows for this movie so it's i only pointed out as the schizophrenia of an actor's existence yeah and it was it was a very very successful james wan is the producer and within that realm he's he's quite the thing uh i was amazed at how successful it was it was shocking yeah. You know, but it was, and it shot in LA, which was at the time was unheard of, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of things grisly, you had an excellent turn on Dexter. Now, mm. I have to say, it's not a show I ever watched, but I did watch sections of it, obviously, to see your work. Um, and I can kind of understand how it took off because it's a really clever idea. I remember trying to watch it and I was just like, oh, because it is very grisly. Um, Tell us a little bit about your time on Dexter and yeah, how that was. It's a very intense shoot. That first episode, uh, 
It was Dexter and myself for the whole day. The whole day we beat up on each other and they had stuff, men, but we never used them. And it was intense. It was even more intense for him because I was, as a character and as an actor, defending myself in a bar brawl. Mm -hmm. But to him, for, for the people who don't know, I played the guy who killed Dexter's mother, which led to, uh, uh, and now he tracks me down. So it was very, very, uh, very intense. And uh, I find it very interesting when sometimes, you, you know, I have, I have one of those faces. And there's other people sort of know I'm an actor, but they, they, they don't often, depending on the genre, able to place me. Yeah. Uh, right. But I, I have a game when I watch a person's face and if I think they're coming to approach me and I can see a smile or a light, I try to guess what is the genre, from what show do they recognize, do they recognize me from? And the Dexter people are always very different <laughs> than the Stargate people or the Once Upon a Time people. They're very, very different uh, uh, breed, but uh, it's an excellent show. And, uh, uh, you know, I was really pleased to be a part of it. So Yeah. Well, speaking of Stargate, that brings us very neatly to a character that is beloved by fans, seemingly also the crew and the cast. Everybody adored Jafar Master Braytak. Uh, and what a gift of a character to play. How did the role come to you? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's funny. It came right after Zorro. I just got back from Zorro. So I got back mid-June and I had the audition directly after the 4th of July. It's funny, I remember precisely because yes. it was such an important... Uh, I didn't know it was an important audition, but I, because ultimately it was. And I remember working on it over 4th of July weekend, so I had plenty of time. And, uh, you know, as actors, they say it's a reading. There are no readings. They're actings. You better go in. There is no time to rehearse necessarily. You might be shooting the next day. So they need to see it for any of you that are actors. It's just the way it is. That's you a know? pearl of wisdom, everybody, because yeah. that is so true. And especially now, there's no time. So don't, no time. don't mess around and be like, oh, well, I'll just do a half ass thing. Give it. No, you do it. Give it. So uh, I go in and here's, here's the interesting thing. The only thing I, uh, Braytac, uh, 133 year old, uh, uh, Jaffa master, uh, uh, Stargate. I'd seen the film and I'd liked the film and, uh, Vancouver. Oh, Vancouver. I loved that town. You know, we had yeah. come through, uh, we'd gone to, uh, the Rocky mountains and we took the train across the Vancouver. It was a fantastic time. That's all I saw. Vancouver. So when I all of a sudden got the job, now I'm going up and I'm realizing, oh my God, I got the job, but 133. Yeah. 4 a.m. makeup call, right? 4 a.m., that's it. And <laughs> so I go in for my fitting, which is it's interesting as an actor because I, we still don't know who the character is. I, I need the help of the designer. I need everyone. So I've, okay, he's, he seems to be a samurai Bushido Roman warrior, but there's something in size that is almost Shakespearean about him. So I, I'm putting off and we come up with the outfit and I'm thinking, oh, this would be this. No, this is, yeah, I get this. This gives me some more size and bulk, you know, not height, but so I mean, this is great. And as I'm leaving, the second AD says, uh, Jan Newman needs to see you in the makeup trailer. She's the uh, makeup key. And I'm thinking, oh, there it is. Yeah. Just come from the airport. There it is from 4 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> you know, forget the English Bay Seawalk, for those of you who know Vancouver. And uh, I go in, I stick my head in the makeup uh, trailer, said, hi, I'm Tony, I'm playing Braytac, the 133-year-old. She looks at me very carefully. She goes, you'll be fine. <laughs> now, <laughs> insulted. Now, now I'm thinking, what? You know, but of course you realize uh, you don't need, uh, the makeup was not an issue. Uh, and it was just terrific. It was just uh, a wonderful experience. Uh, again, as actors, I keep saying we're, it's new. It's not like we, we're, we're still looking. Mario Azapardi, I don't, did Mario direct any of your episodes? No, unfortunately not. Mario is a big Maltese man. And Mario is, is influential in the creation of Braytac because I watched Mario. Because oh. Mario, you know, Mario had some of this. Yeah, he was, so there was bluster to Mario. And I thought, 
you know, and I'm watching, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. There was something primal about Mario. Yeah. And, and, and you're still trying to, you're still grabbing, you know, you're still uh, trying to create this stew in a kind of way. You know, everyone thinks we have it going in. And uh, so, I, you know, I remember that when I was Chris, of course, you know, uh, we read a script. You know, everyone thinks Richard Dean Anderson, Richard Dean Anderson. I read the script. Yeah, I, I, I've watched MacGyver and Richard. Thank you very much. There's only one person I care about in the script. And that is this actor called Christopher Judge. Anyone else? I could care less. This, for great tack, this is the only person that exists. Mm -hmm. So when I get on set, that's who I'm looking for. You yeah. Know? And, you know, I meet Chris and, you know, it's so wonderful because you'd like to think that you need to talk and figure. We just sort of looked at each other. As a matter of fact, there's a funny story that Chris tells. Uh, I arrived and they were shooting and I, you know, uh, something was going on. And Richard was sort of like maybe 50 feet in front of them and the, the crew, the rest of the crew was behind them. And I, I just arrived and I was walking. Obviously, they weren't shooting. And I was going over to say hi to Chris is what I was going to and Richard, of course, being the number one, yeah. assumed it was coming to say hi to him. <laughs> and all the guys were just amazed because I sort of walked right by him and walked right up to Chris and they were like, who is this guy? What? Well, I, didn't, I really didn't know any better, to be honest with you. And I'll tell you another secret. I didn't know Richard's uh, sense of humor at the time. It's so dry Very. And, and, and so caustic in a kind of way that if you're, if you're too serious, and you can't deal with that. You think, yeah, you, know, you it could get you up. Well, a couple of times I bit my cheek because I, you know, and thank well, thank God I didn't say anything because there would have went, you know, twenty three. There would have went uh, twenty five additional episodes and the realization <laughs> that Rick is actually a wonderful guy and a wonderful actor. Yeah, I loved it. They had stuff with Amanda where they forced him. I always said. Rick in that show, we blew up the bubble mm -hmm. and his job or the balloon, his job was to per pierce it and blow it up. That, and that was the humor. That was his job. Unlike uh, Kurt Russell, which was a whole different thing. Yeah. That was his. And so consequently, when they cornered him and forced him really to act, it was so special mm -hmm. because he'd been a cut up most of the time. I mean, they would write comedy sometimes. It was hard to deliver it because he would change the punchline. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, you know, absolutely. That's, that's Rick, you know. Absolutely. Uh, but wonderful. But you, uh, your chemistry with Chris was amazing because it was tangible. And I have a little surprise for you, which is I got in touch with Chris and I said to him that I was doing this. So I hope you can hear this. But hello, Miss Sue Ann. You beautiful creature, you. I miss you. Uh, here, you have one of my favorite people on earth with you today. Lovely, <laughs> talented, hilarious, gentlemanly, Mr. Tony Amendola. <laughs> Tony, I love you, brother. I miss <laughs> you. Um, one of my favorite uh, moments with Tony, and I, I can't remember if it was uh, Birthright or Sacrifices or which episode it was, because I'm old now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we were sharing a symbiote in a scene, and we were lying on the shoreline in each other's arms as good Jaffa will do. <laughs> and uh, we're in each other's arms shooting this scene for hours. Well, I believe it was uh, Deloise who uh, was directing and uh, of course, Deloise is screaming his <laughs> directions of hold each other like you love each other, cuddle, cuddle like men. <laughs> but um, I had determined that I would.
was going to make Tony break. <laughs> so uh, during one of the takes, I unleashed this wonderfully loud, completely <laughs> dramatic. <laughs> and everyone around us busted up laughing. But there was nothing from Tony. <laughs> and after a, a few seconds, Tony slowly looked over at me and said, in character, Tilk, did you say something? <laughs> and, uh, so, of course, I broke it. And uh, it was uh, one of the, the more hilarious moments uh, that, that we had together among many. Um, I, I consider myself so fortunate um, not only to have been able to share the screen uh, with Tony, but also to be enveloped uh, in his wisdom and his mentorship and his love and most of all his friendship, which uh, will continue uh, till the day I no longer walk this earth. Um, Tony Amendola, I, I miss you, brother, and I love you, and uh, hopefully I will see you soon. Take care, you guys. Oh, how about that? Yeah. This is oh, about don't want that. I don't want that. <laughs> That's me sending a message back. We definitely don't want to hear that. <laughs> I'm not having well, a break with the. That about says it. <laughs> exactly. I think he summed it up perfectly. Um, you know, there's been lots of talk about the Stargate franchise coming back, possibly, and I wondered if it were to come back. Firstly, if you would like to be involved, uh, and secondly, what would you like to see for Braytac? You, you know, it's fun. Yes, yes, I would like to be involved with it. Yes, uh, and uh, you know, it, there's there's two things. Obviously, I, I'd like to keep on developing the relationship with Chris and the others, but I. I I always had this vision that there would be a uh, like a UN ceremony or something where, you know, just finally stepping down because Braytac went from trainer to warrior to rebel to statesman over the course of the uh, uh, show. But I always imagined there'd be this, you know, very ceremonious retirement sort of thing. And of course, that's when a major attack would happen, which would force the continue. Uh, so, you know, there's that. I've always, I've always wondered if anywhere there's a Mrs. Braytac around. If there's, what that, yeah, there you go. This is Hello. Braytac. Uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, man has job, man must do. Uh, you yeah. know, that type of thing that, you know, sacrifice. And I, you know, I, I always thought there would be, you know, that would be interesting, but, uh, uh, Hawthor meets uh, Bray you know? Yeah, yes, no, it, possibly. A battle. You know, there's a funny story, too. Um, in that episode, we shot it. We were waiting for golden light, you know. Yes. Yeah. You know, and uh, it was so we shot it at the Fraser River, right? Not far from the airport over there. And the salmon were running mm -hmm. at the time, so. And I remember, at the, I don't forget, that might have been the fourth or fifth season, I forget. But there was still talk that, are they going to continue? Or is the show going to be dropped? Is the show going to be dropped? And, and I was listening to Michael and Chris and stuff. You know, I'm a, I'm a guest star. I, I, you know, who knows? You know, to me, I just, I'm listening. And, I, and I'm watching the salmon jump. And it's one of the most beautiful things. They jump up and the sunlight catches them. And they shine everything. And I said, uh, I said to the two of them, I said, uh, Stargate's coming back. What are you talking about? Stargate is going to be renewed for the next season. So how do you know? And I said, well, look, I pointed to the river. Even the salmon are jumping up to get a look at you guys. So, <laughs> <laughs> that was my... And then it and, came uh, true. Uh, it, it came true for like five or six more years. So. Exactly. <laughs> 
Um, and actually, that uh, that recording of Chris was uh, was quite moving. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, he was a real sport. I, I always like to do a little surprise if I can for, for my guests. So I'm delighted that, uh, that you liked it. I'm surprised it didn't have any sound effects or anything. No <laughs> I think he'd just woken up. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, it sounded that way, didn't it? <laughs> Either that or it was a very rough afternoon. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to ask him. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Actually, and it was because of Stargate that a kind of serendipitous connection that kind of led you to your role as Kagami in Continuum. What was that connection? Well, you know, it was very funny. There are some jobs, and you probably have done this, uh, where you, again, you wonder, why me? How did this happen? And this role came up in Continuum. And I, I, you know, went through the whole process. I auditioned once, auditioned twice, had to come back, you know, and it was getting serious. But I'm, I'm thinking, what is the connection? It was almost like the, it, there was a big cosmic finger being pointed, you know, uh, saying, you're the one. Yeah. I wondered, I wondered, I wondered. And finally, I looked it up. And the guy who wrote the episode that Braytac premiered, his name is Jeff King. Right. And he, he was the, one of the executive producers, along with Simon Barry, who's a fantastic uh, guy and creator, and has Warrior Nona right now. He's the guy yes. from Warrior Nona. And that was my connection. And I thought, oh, that's what it is. So it's always useful uh, to try and track that down, because I would have walked in unknowing you know, that how thankful I needed to be to Jeff. And, because I'm certain, again, we all know there are eight or nine people. And, and Jeff said, no, I saw that episode of Stargate. That was, he took what I wrote and made it, you know, you love it when it's sort of like a, uh, uh, an alchemy of sorts that, uh, that goes in. And uh, so that led to uh, um, Continuum, and that led to another winter in Vancouver, and I was made honorary. Honorary Canadian friends Yay. gave me belief and everything, you know. Uh, I love that. I, you know, I really, as you, I imagine you love Vancouver oh, too, Oh, I right? love it. It's, yeah. Love you know, what a great nation and uh, uh, as the people and um, so there it is. I, I hope I hope we get a chance to go back up there again, although, you know, I have worked there since. So. Yeah. yeah, you will. I feel it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. With Kagami, he's a very layered, complex character and has to make some very questionable, I suppose, decisions for us. And I wondered how you as Tony the person um, worked your way towards someone like that. Because, you know, some people will call it a terrorist. Some people would say freedom fighter. It's that whole thing. Um, so I wondered what your process was with that. Yeah, I, there's a saying, some wit said, uh, you know, can, you can describe Kagami as the, uh, the black sheep of a very gray family. You know? <laughs> yes. uh, uh, you know, you're always looking for a way in, uh, something, it can be anything. Uh, one of the images I use is I try to go to an organ in the body. Yeah, that, I've heard you mention that a few times. So tell us a bit more about that. That's fascinating to me. Well, you can... Uh, it, it, it's where people lead from. You know, we all know some people lead from their intellect, some people lead from their emotions, some people lead from intuition. It's, it's all of those uh, sorts of things. And Kagami was almost a Lenin Trotsky-like uh, character who, who was well on his way possibly to becoming a Stalin. If, right. uh, you know. But he was, he was trying to create change. It was a, it was a potent, series because it was right in the midst of the Occupy movement. Mm. You know, that's when the, that was going on. And so that was an image too uh, for him. And uh, it was very, very useful to have that because I couldn't come in with, you know, exposing myself. That's not what he does. He be, wouldn't be true to the character. So you, you have to do that, particularly in relation to another character I was playing uh, simultaneously, which was sort of interesting mm. uh, to be playing these two characters side by side. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I got cast in, a, uh, in Once Upon a Time. Yes. 
And, and once upon a time, I'm playing a very iconic role, archetypal of Geppetto. So now you've got those two. I'm doing it at the same time in Vancouver, but what a joy. Oh, yeah. Actors, actors never get overworked, you know, because we're thinking, oh my, and we know we'll have plenty of time to rest another time. But, uh, but to really answer your question, it has to be almost in contrast. Uh, Kagami mental, ends justify the means. Very cold. Uh, uh, Jeff and Simon created a, a flashback that you learned why he was like this. Uh, and generally, that's always very personal. It was a family thing. It's, uh, people were killed and he had to. And that's sort of what made him close down in a kind of way, getting very, very cold and very. And then Geppetto is anything but mental. Yeah, the opposite. It's all about, yeah, it's all about the heart. And I was so appreciative that when they created Geppetto, they did not, obviously everyone thinks of the Disney movie. This is not the Disney movie. No. And they allowed me to bring in a kind of fierceness at times it, out of protection uh, that he, even Geppetto in that, th in that show did some questionable things all to protect this boy. So that character was all heart. Mm -hmm. As soon as I started thinking too much, I'd say, no, look, Tony, that's not the character. It all, it all was about you know, what's going on with him. And it worked really well because unlike the, uh, the film in Once Upon a Time, it was everybody, everybody's trying to get back to the fairyland. Everyone was trying to get back to the enchanted forest. So we were all suffering in a kind of way uh, by, uh, by missing. So everyone had a missing piece uh, to us. So there was a sadness in that show. And it played really, really well into the notion of, of the heart. Mm -hmm. And again, Kagami was all very mental, always a step ahead, always trying to, to manipulate. And he could fall back on saying, yes, it's for the greater good. Mm -hmm. But it, it was it was quite violent at times, you know, so. Yeah. And um, Continuum uh, reunited you with a lot of the Stargate family, including Amanda Tapping, who this time was directing you. What was she like as a director? I imagine a dream. She was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. First of all, the great thing is we had a shorthand. There was no, uh, she didn't, uh, she felt like, she, I, I hoped she felt like she could speak to me and, and just tell me what she needed. And I, I did not feel uh, uh, intrusive, you know, asking or, or, or you know, for, wouldn't it be great suggesting things as an actor. And um, it, was, it was just a lovely, lovely, ep uh, lovely episode. And the other one, the other Stargate uh, is my surrogate daughter in that, in Continuum at least the character I made into my surrogate daughter was yeah. Lexa Doig. Yeah. So we had, you know, so there was, you know, Michael, uh, Michael, I think was in Toronto, Michael Shanks was in Toronto doing series at the time, uh, but occasionally would pop in and uh, just get spent, spend time with Lexa was great. And uh, just to end up, well, the other thing is all of a sudden camera operators from Stargate, Will, Wear Will Waring, all yeah. of a sudden is the director. So they're all, all of these connections that were just fantastic, uh, you know, to know each other. And, uh, you know, but I have to correct something. I, I agree with you. The crew may have been happy to see Braytac and happy to see Tony. But on second thought, they realized if they saw my character, yeah. they were going back to a gravel pit. Well, and that's that's true. <laughs> I spent more time in gravel pits in Vancouver than... <laughs> But, and like, not him again. <laughs> oh, please. Tony, great to see you. Oh, no. Exactly. <laughs> um, so as you said, these two jobs, it so often happens with an actor, it's either feast or famine. And yeah. you suddenly had these two wonderful characters, complete polar opposites, playing, acting at the same time. Did you ever have days where you were like, who am I today? <laughs> Well, every day is like that for us, isn't it? <laughs> yes, that's true. Especially now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah, well, you know, it, it would, I eventually just decided on going with the red nose. And then I knew, so I had the red nose on. Uh, uh, you know, I, it, it's like, uh, it, it is a problem in rep. Where <laughs> yes, that's rep, true. You, know, you put the wrong costume on or something, but it's <laughs> off the right there. But... Uh, no, it was, frankly, it was a joy. Mm -hmm. It was a, a respite from the other world to go and play Geppetto after living in the, 
in the uh, uh, hard, cold, intellectual Kagami world, and yeah. then vice versa. I've had enough of heart, thank you very much. I need some steel. And then yeah. to step into Kagami and um, it was great. And also it was sort of an interesting, uh, um, it was just an interest, both were interesting series mm -hmm. to, for me. Uh, what uh, Eddie uh, chose to do with um, Once Upon a Time and what uh, Simon chose to do with Continuum uh, were just fascinating to me. Uh, you know, once upon a time, everyone uh, was thinking, well, you can't have that. I'm trying to remember, there was another series on at the time that was also similarly based on uh, fairy tales and other things. I forget what it was called now. Mm -hmm. It was shot in Portland. And people said, oh, no, you can't have two, you can't have two. And I read the scripts and thought, oh, these, these are so different. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I just, I love the variety. It's one of the reasons when I can, uh, uh, I love the switch back and forth, you know, between film uh, and television and theater. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sometimes I'll do it just because, like, uh, I'm doing some work, and the one of the last things I did was Amadeus. I finally got a chance to do Amadeus and play Solieri, uh, and that was so refreshing to go do that and work that hard. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. Uh, but every so often, I sometimes you need to make a deposit an artistic deposit mm -hmm. and if you're really lucky and you're a star and you have some control you can get that artistic deposit from film and television without question and it's the best but often you don't mm -hmm. but you you can get it on stage so i i like to think of it as a going back and making a deposit in my craft in myself uh in uh, in in the source because i don't know what you feel you know, we're one of the few professions where, you know, we can actually track, you know, f the transition from priest uh, to, to vagabond yeah. to sort of uh, accepted profession over 2,500 years. And that excites me, the notion of being backstage, uh, waiting to go on an opening night and think, my God, you know, there was probably some guy just as frightened as I am or worried or anxious uh, in an Aeschylus play. Mm -hmm. And that to me, is, is one of the reasons I do it. It's a continuum, no pun intended, of, uh, <laughs> of, of work and a profession. So I, that's why I do it. It's not easy. It's, it's much more glamorous to be film and television. Sure. Much more. And, um, and it's, it's much more recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but there is a unique experience. Uh, one of the reasons... Uh, I grew up in New Haven and I was lucky. I didn't get into acting until college. But in New Haven, just like Bristol Rep or any of those things, the, you know, in, in England, there were two repertory theaters, Yale Rep and Long Wharf. And they did fabulous work, very different aesthetics. One was uh, a company-based, more traditional rep, and one was doing more cutting edge things. Mm -hmm. But some of my earliest experience is seeing Christopher Walken, seeing John Lithgow, seeing all of these, you know, uh, just uh, incredible, incredible uh, uh, actors on stage. Uh, you know, Pacino was a young, uh, and I, all I realized is when I was lost in college and I didn't know what to do on a Saturday night and I was feeling just strange that I could walk to this theater put down the money for a, a, a ticket, a student ticket, and go to Wales, or go to Ireland, or go to the American South, or go to a Shakespeare world. And even if it was, and it could not have been farther from my experience. Yeah. I, it was medicinal to me, but sitting in a room with 500 people, watching an event, good, bad, or indifferent, there was something medicinal about witnessing. And that's one of the things. To, yeah. To and storytelling is so important, you know, we have yeah. to keep we need it. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's what a lovely, lovely anecdote and, and wisdom to share with us. Wisdom? Wisdom to share with wisdom, us. Wisdom. Wisdom. I don't Watch know about wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've really loved doing these Hathor hosts because I must tell you, I have learned so much about the people I've interviewed. And every week there is within the body of work a little surprise, a little gem. And for me, the surprise 
for you or from you was your episode on crusade where you are quite unrecognizable under layers of prosthetics that was four and a half hours in the makeup trailer i bet <laughs> um there is a moment where your character hears mozart for the first time which is really interesting bringing you back to salieri um and there's just one moment where he just it's so beautiful that when I watched, and it really took me by surprise. I watched it and I was like, I teared up. I was like, oh, you know, um, and I wondered if, firstly, if that was in the script, because it felt almost improvised. Yeah. Yeah, it was an exciting episode to do. And uh, uh, Mike Vehar directed that. Yeah, Mike who Vehar weirdly directed me in something. So when I saw really? that, I was like, oh my God, yeah. That's so Fantastic. good. Yeah, and I ended up doing uh, uh, Star Trek uh, Voyager because of Mike. But uh, it is scripted in the sense that it's loosely described, but actually what happened is not scripted at all. And that was something Mike and myself came up with. And it was, it's the only time, I, I've worn prosthetic in Angel and in other uh, series, and it's the only time I've been in the wagon that I surprised myself. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I, I startled myself. You know, you know, when you're running lines and I looked in a mirror and did not recognize myself. Yeah. And it was weird. I, you know, because I was wearing the big blue contacts and the you know, marble contacts. And so, yeah. I mean, I was unrecognizable. No, no one, even an angel, it, it, you could, if you really look carefully, you can see sort of my bone structure or something. This, nothing. Yeah. And it, it was so fantastic to do that. And so Beautiful. I, it was called, I think it's called The Needs of Earth, uh, yes. the episode. And I always tell people, people, you know, when they ask you some of your favorite episodes, they think they'll all be Stargate or Once Upon a Time. And, and that one uh, was fantastic. Uh, a person you think is a, uh, um, a Nazi, a world criminal, a, a Mengele, and they're hunting him down. And then you realize, no, what he actually is, he lives in a very militaristic uh, planet and he's saving all the culture. Yeah. And that is doing and now he needs to decide you know, who will and and it, it still moves me greatly to think you know because he's just waking up trying to figure out what and then he makes this sort of connection with this sound that he's never ever heard before and it gives him great pleasure and hope and startles him. it's fantastic but also it it was just one of those great surprises. It was a terrific, terrific, it was uh, Babylon 5 Crusade. And I'm so sorry they didn't continue it. There was some difficulty between creatives and the, and the, and the studios. And I think, uh, I think the actors and the fans lost out. Mm. Uh, and it's a shame because Gary Cole was he's terrific, you know. Yeah. They were wonderful people on it. Well, it was uh, an absolute treat and a surprise for me. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> sure, thank um, you. In most recent years, you have been kept very, very, very busy uh, as a voice actor and have worked on some of the biggest games in the world, like Final Fantasy, The World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, and most recently, Star Wars Jedi, which I believe was your first mocap experience. <laughs> How was well, that? <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it was fantastic. Let me tell you. One of the reasons it's fantastic, and, and it just occurred to me when I was doing it, I thought, my God, I've had the joy of being in Stargate, Star Trek, Babylon 5, and Star Wars. And I thought, I, I bet there aren't many, <laughs> many actors who, who have had even a, you know, a small foot in any of those uh, areas. So that, of course, to play a Jedi, you know, I... Yes! I, I, <laughs> yes, I thought of him as a cousin, a cousin to uh, Braytac, although uh, Cordoba is, is very, very different. He's a, he's more of an archaeologist than he is uh, anything, but it was great, great fun. You know, uh, the voice work, you realize as a modern actor, uh, it's like, I, I've never had patience for actors who said, no, I am a, I am a theater actor, you understand? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've never, it, it, it's fine, great. Terrific, you know, but I, I believe I, I grew up in the, li have lived in the 20th and 21st century. I think you need to make your peace with that world in some fashion. And the, the worst thing you can do is not experience it. Mm -hmm. You can, if you go and try and do it and try, and six months you say, this is not for you, God bless you, leave, yes. 
and life's too short. But the notion of, of saying, uh, uh, you know, I don't do that. And the same thing with, uh, you know, film and television. There's the same arrogance, mind you, about yeah. the theater. You know, why would you work that hard? Their arrogance is, why would you work that hard for so little money? Yeah. And you try to explain to him the, you know, the 25 years and the immediate, 2,500 years of the craft and the immediate experience, they don't get it. But uh, Cordoba was, was terrific, uh, uh, fun to work on. And voice acting, I got into it because I remember reading that actually video games and voice work was one of the most uh, uh, highest grossing sorts of uh, endeavors for the studios and everything. And I thought, well, I better figure something out. So, you know, I looked for a voice agent and the first job I got, oddly, was World of Warcraft. It was a great job that you'll appreciate. It was uh, got a character named Khadgar, uh, a ma mag magician, uh, warrior type guy. And it's the gift that keeps giving. Yeah. Because it was occurring. I probably have done, I don't know, 15 or 16, you know, sessions. And it's the gift that keeps giving. Because as actors, to get a job, and then just afterwards, just simply get the call. It's so not having to audition. Uh, and that, uh, that led me to uh, mocap, which I love. You know, once yeah. you get the little, you know, the little dots. And, uh, <laughs> a little tight-fitting, uh, unflattering suit, but, you know. Oh, it is, isn't it? Isn't it? But, uh, but it, it, you know, it's a joy. There was a clip recently. I don't know if you saw it on Facebook. Um, there was a clip. Uh, it was something in the effect of, it was something in the effect of a birthday present for the son of a special effects man. Oh no. And, I oh my God. It had this little kid, you know, he's just doing very mundane things. And then yeah. his dad puts in all, or his mom puts in all the, <laughs> so now he's just walking along a railing, but then, you know, in the film, yeah. he's walking along a railing, you know, that's drops, you know, a mile. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. It's very different. Uh, not being able to see uh, what you're responding to. And also, mm. there are some problems. I, have you ever wanted a beak? You ever want, you know what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. It's where the camera... Yeah, it's, it's like a beak. It's sort of like a beak, a, a metal structure like in uh, War Horse. Right. Or, something, you know, or an Equus. It sort yeah. of looks like it's got a camera and an individual light. Ah. Which, you know, and they do the whole thing, you know, they capture your mouth. It's very, very interesting. You, they're going to get rid of us soon enough, you know. They're yeah, doing everything can to get rid of actors. But uh, uh, what's amazing is all of a sudden now you have uh, uh, reunions with a long lost daughter or, or someone, and all of a sudden you're trying to negotiate hugging and embracing. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> you, know, you know, it has to be choreographed. Uh, you know, frankly, it's great. It's great fun because they're all different. It's all, yeah. uh, in a kind of way, initially, I, I enjoyed it even more than film and television because we get it's every job is a, I say every job is a, a, a rose with a scent and thorns, but, but it's also you get sort of accustomed to this is how it goes. Mm -hmm. So, and all of a sudden to come in and feel like a kid again, the way you did the first time you stepped on a stage or a sound stage or in front of a movie camera to all of a sudden get that, you know, and there's a whole different vocabulary. Um, they have to calibrate your body. So there are yeah. certain things you have to do after every take. You have to extend your arms out and you have to do different sorts of things. And you, you, you feel like an idiot because you forget. Yeah. You know, oh, you think it's over. No, no, calibrate, calibrate. <laughs> you know, and uh, so it's great. Uh, the newness of it creates stimulus, which makes you feel alive, makes you feel, and releases dopamine and makes you feel happy. So yeah. it's a dry. Yeah. Well, what a treat this has been and a full circle from Master Braytac to the Master Jedi uh, Cordoba. And I, I am aware that we've kept you for such a long time. There are a few, uh, really a few um, fan questions. And I wondered if you have time, if you'd be kind enough to sure. answer those. Yeah, um, yeah. So the first one is during your long and amazing career, you've met and worked with many A-list actors. Which one impressed you the most so far, whether it be his raw talent, charisma, presence on screen, et cetera, and why? I would say Hopkins because it goes, it goes right back. But there's another one. Hopkins in terms of the star, mm -hmm. in, terms of, uh, in terms of being approachable and being, uh, uh, 
just warm, but just having great, great talent and, you know, stratospheric sort of actor, you know. Um, but on a different note, in Lone Star, my scene was with an up and coming actor at the time named Chris Cooper. Oh, I love him. And all my whole day was with him. And he goes on to win the Academy Award and, and stuff. So I, I'm, I admire great talent like, uh, you know, Anthony Hopkins. And, uh, and I think we have amazing talent these days. Uh, mm. Oscar Isaac. Uh, I mean, it's just uh, Michelle Williams. I mean, there are amazing young actors these days. But I, I always root for the character guy or gal who sort of finally breaks through. They've been doing it. Yeah. I always say, I always say uh, people understand two things about actors, generally. Star and starving. They don't <laughs> understand a working class actor who puts together a life, has a family, has a, you know, does the best, they pays their bills. Yeah. Has, you know, uh, they only understand the extreme. So guys like Chris Cooper, um, Dennis Franz, uh, uh, John Spencer, who was on West Wing, if you recall. Yeah, uh, great actor. And, yeah. Uh, I got to work with John the day, day after he won his Emmy, and it was such a joy. And, but it was very interesting because he, this is a guy who'd been doing it forever on stage and everything, and he was quite nervous. Oh. He was quite because now he had an Emmy. Now he wasn't yeah. John Spencer, the admired, skillful actor. He was John Spencer, the the uh, Emmy winner. Yeah. You know, and it took him by surprise for a little bit. It took him a while. To finally shake it off and then we got down to business and I thought isn't that interesting uh there's this perception remind I don't it reminds me of a story can I tell a funny story please was, please yeah there was a, a story about uh Rex Harrison going around with Claudette Colbert they were in a play I saw it in San Francisco called Kingfisher and it was a very formulaic play but the two of them were fantastic and Rex Harrison I mean ease on stage is not the word yeah. Well, the stage manager of that, it, it toured the United States. The stage manager at every opening in every town, Rex Harrison would come late to half hour, only on opening night. And oh. he'd gather him by the, by the stage. He'd be looking through the peephole in the proscenium, swearing at the audience. <laughs> and this went on and on. Then he'd go on and do the show, and it was successful. And this went on. So finally, when the show was over, he, he said, Rex, it's been a joy working with you. But I got a question. What is it? What is it? What is it on opening night? And you're Rex Harrison. You're looking at the audience, swearing at him. He says, "My dear boy, you you don't understand. I have to go out there every night and be as good as I never was." <laughs> <laughs> there it is. You know that's fame. You're yeah. All of a sudden, you're not. You he can't just be Rex Harrison. He has to be this Rex Harrison. And that yeah. was true of John Spencer. Now it made him think about his. It made him self conscious about his own talent. It's fascinating. It's interesting, isn't it? It's such a double-edged sword. Oh, yeah. Um, such a double-edged sword. That's, oh, we could talk for days. Uh, right, you are fluent in Italian and Spanish, and I gather the Italian is from your mother, but what is the story re-speaking Spanish? Oh, I just always loved the, uh, I'm not completely fluent, I want to be honest, uh, but, I, you know, I can get by. Uh, uh, it's just a uh, culture that attracts me. Uh, I got to do a project in Barcelona not that long ago, but what a joy in Madrid. Oh boy. Uh, so it's just the culture that uh, attracts me and um, I love the people, I love the language, I love the whole shebang. So yeah. So it's just it's okay. more, yeah. Dad, get off Zoom. <laughs> Anyone get off Zoom. Uh, right, two more questions. Um, so I have, uh, let's see, uh, what play would you still love to perform on stage or role, I guess? What role would I love to perform? Well, you know, right now I'd really love to direct uh, uh, Misanthrope to Moliere. Oh, yeah. That's some directing. I'm trying to think. Well, you know, one wonders, you know, uh, you know, there's Death of Salesman in terms of the big iconic things. But frankly, I'd love to do a comedy. Mm -hmm. I think life is oppressive right now. I think we need laughter. Uh, yeah, so that would be, that would be nice uh, to do. What else? There's, there is a, uh, oh, I, I'd love to do Prosper. There you go. Oh, yes. Perfect.
And final question, which is a two-parter. Tony, will you ever come to Australia for Oz Comic Con? And what was your favorite part of Stargate SG-1? Uh, yes, I, all you have to do is invite me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I think it's going to be a while, uh, you know, until we sort this, um, this pandemic out. But I would I've had one, uh, marvelous times in Australia and the people are just great. And uh, uh, as for my, uh, I think it gets back to this episode called Threshold. That I think was my favorite episode because it was the backstory to Tilk, uh, our relationship. And uh, it, it was so intense that there was a, some snow shoot. There's a funny story in the, snow about uh, Chris. Chris came up to me and we're shooting outside of Vancouver in, in the snow and we're training. He's a young, uh, I'm his mentor teacher and he's a young student warrior. And he says, you know, what would be cool? It's freezing out here. Let's do it bare chested. Let's, you know, that we're almost. And I say, yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, let me, and then, and I think it's, you know, that's a good, good visual, a good idea. It says something there. And then it occurs to me, Okay, it's going to be three or four hours, you know. So I, I, I go back, I knock on this thing. I say, Chris, let me up you one. That is a brilliant idea because of this, this, and this. But if we're both that way, it doesn't make, I think it has to be like the student and the teacher is good. And he said, oh, absolutely great. So anyway, you cut to an hour later, he's on, <laughs> he's on a snow blanket. You discover what's snow and I'm just <laughs> grinning ear to ear. But uh, you know, that one uh, is just special. And also, it was when I realized, I think it might have been my fourth episode, that they really liked the character and really liked the work. Because uh, Brad Wright uh, came up to me, uh, uh, who had, he wrote that episode. And yeah, it was the following episode I, had, I was doing. And he said, oh, I've been, you know, I've been finally doing the final cut of Threshold. And he said, um, and he didn't, say this with a smile he just said i just want you to know i uh, i didn't cut a single frame out wow and i and it was just said so honestly and, and i thought oh okay great and you know and also to write that to care that much and 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 give that backstory for chris and myself was uh, huge uh so anyway those that's my favorite memory uh outside of uh Chris's pyrotechnics, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all experienced those. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you have been a mentor, a star, the patience of Job tonight because of our hiccups on YouTube. And again, apologies, everyone. I'm beginning, it's definitely me because it seems to go wrong you on know. Instagram as well. <laughs> but, it, follow, uh, it follows you around. Exactly, it's exactly. <laughs> But I just wanted to say an enormous thank you for spending such a long time answering my questions, for being such a gracious and entertaining, informative and amazing guest. Well, let me tell you, as I said, you know, before this started, I, I, I look forward to when we can be in the same room together. Me too. Uh, yes, it's so warm and so nice. And I want to say a special uh, thank you to all the fans. I miss you. And I hope we can all be in the room together very, very soon. Please keep watching. You make us, you make us do our work. So thank you. Absolutely. Perfect way to end. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.